Hello and welcome once again to the Perimeter Church Podcast. How often have we seen someone a bit chaotic, but described as having a method to their madness? Without calling God mad, he does have a method. Director of Redemptive Unity Jimmy Kim continues the series Radical Renewal with this sermon entitled The Radical Mission of God and His Church which covers Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. For more information and to watch or hear other sermons, please visit our website at perimeter.org. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jimmy Kim, the director of Redemptive Unity, and I am so glad to be back here to to teach and be a part of this Acts series. They've given me an incredible task. Uh, Preaching in and of itself is an incredible task. Uh, But in particular, to teach on two entire chapters is a whole task altogether unto itself. So we're going to do our best. Rather, I'm going to do my best. Well, you you guys partner along with me in this as, you know, participants, right, as you listen. Um, I'm going to point us to God's word, and I hope that we leave this place uh, after the sermon and after uh, the remainder of our worship service as people who are ready to go out on radical mission. And the title of today's message is The Radical Mission of God and His Church. And we're in, in a second, we'll read from Acts chapter 13, 1 through 5 as a great precursor and as a really a, an appetizer and a moose bouche, if you will, if you are a foodie um, that will get our appetites wet. But the main idea of our sermon today is this, that God is active, that God, our Father, is active in unfolding his plan for kingdom expansion, and he calls his people to be faithful and active followers. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 13. The word of the Lord says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they went down, uh, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Could you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord, we ask and we plead with you that our hearts would be open and softened to hear your word. May our eyes be open to see and to, to read, to understand and comprehend these words here. And our ears open, Lord, to hear your voice speaking to us. And Lord, I pray that you would guide the, 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 the teaching of today's word through me, that that which needs to be remembered would be remembered, and that which is not fall off to the side. But ultimately, that God, you, would be glorified and honored through our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The last time I was here, I shared a little story about playing Monopoly with my children, Uh, And contrary to uh, whatever impression I gave you of myself, I do love my kids a lot. (laughs) One of the ways that my love for my children uh, is manifested or is exhibited is me watching my daughter who plays soccer uh, and the joy that she gives me watching her play a sport that she so much loves. And as an 11-year-old, you know when someone loves something, they are all about it. And my daughter is all about soccer. There's something that happens, though, when we go to these soccer games. And as a parent, you know, whether your child plays soccer or some other sport or some other thing that they participate in, as a parent, on the sidelines, as a bystander, what happens? Especially when something goes wrong. You get frustrated. You have to kind of calm it down and say, you got to be patient. They're 11-year-olds. They're 7-year-olds. They're whatever. Of course, they can't move a soccer ball up the soccer pitch. You know, they're going to have difficulty doing that. Oh, but, you know, most days I am not uh, the most patient. And so I'll yell out, come on, let's go. Let's move the ball up there. And then something interesting happened. I started playing pickup soccer. And guess what? Guess who is ineffective at soccer? (laughs) This guy. And sure enough, after I started playing pickup soccer, 
when I go to watch my daughter, because I know the experience of being out on a soccer pitch, I don't yell as much. I turn over to my wife and I say, that was really impressive. It's not easy to get the ball that's in the air, stop it, and then make a turn and then make a good pass. That is incredibly hard. So those moments where she might make a bad play, and she's 11, so she does, I encourage her and say, come on, keep your head up. Let's go, work together. And those moments when she excels, she's an incredible dribbler. I love it. I love her, her field vision. I tell her, great job. I'm so proud of you. And I'm able to empathize more because I can envision myself on that field because I've been on that field. I'm not just watching as a bystander criticizing what's happening on the field. For us in the church, it is so, so easy to criticize everything that's happening around us when we rarely ever, if ever, move from our pews and move from our couches and move off, sometimes off of our soapboxes. What we see here in Acts chapter 13 and 14 is Paul and Barnabas diving into this radical mission of God. They're not on the sidelines. Neither have they been on the sidelines. They've been active in ministry. They've been active in this radical mission. But now they're really going forward. And for what purpose? Obviously, yes, to be faithful to God and to the calling that's placed in their lives. But also, I believe God is using them to be a model for us. And not just a model for us to look at and appreciate, but a model for us to enter into and participate in. So if I mentioned already this main idea, but the main idea is that God is active in unfolding his plan. And how are we going to see this? I think we're going to look at it in three different ways in this message. We're going to look at the method. We're going to look at the message and its messengers. And thirdly, we're going to look at the means. Method, the message and its messengers, and then the means. So let's dive in to this method. Now, we're not going to read all 70 some odd verses in between these two chapters. Okay. Rather, what I would love for us to do is kind of do a flyover. I will dive into particular verses here and there. Um, but I'm going to challenge you, go back and read Acts 13 and 14 on your own at another time. Okay. And as you do that, I, I hope that this message will make more sense of what you're reading in those two chapters. When we think about this passage, and not only this passage, but when we think about the entire book of Acts, it is very easy for us to lose sight of Jesus' call to the disciples all the way back in Acts 1.8. And if you are tempted to do that, let's all together look at Acts 1.8. It says this, this is Jesus before he goes up into heaven, before he ascends into heaven, and he's looking at his disciples, he's saying, okay, I'm about to leave you. You've already been through a lot. But before I go, I'm going to leave you a gift. And his name is the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Did you hear that? You will be my witnesses where? In the city of Jerusalem, in the region of Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. It's not just a geographical progression of the gospel message. It's not just a geographical expansion of the, of the church, the called out assembly people of God. It's also an expansion in regards to cultural and religious barriers. This is at the heartbeat of this entire book, that the spirit is going to fill you and then you will be my witnesses and watch and read throughout this book how the Spirit enables the church and her people to go forward with this bold message. Acts 1.8 is the ultimate underpinning of what we see in Acts 13 and 14. So that's the, that's, the, the, that's the spirit behind all this, right? No pun intended. But there's also something that's underneath the work that they are going through. So if the heart of the mes- method is the Holy Spirit, right? What's underneath the feet of the messenger is this road, quite literally a road. Now, here's a map of the first journey of Paul and Barnabas, okay? And you can see on this map that they start off in a region in Syria, right? You can see starting point. Um, And there's a region in Syria called Antioch, and they travel from Antioch down to Seleucia, into Cyprus, then into Perga, all the way up into Galatia, into those four Galatian cities, 
Okay, one of those primary cities in Galatia being Antioch. Now, what allowed this travel, which, by the way, was very difficult and very treacherous, but what allowed this travel, especially in what is modern day Turkey, is that there was a road that existed called the Via Sebast. And here's a picture of the Via Sebast. Now, this is a road that was built back in 6 BC. And it looks like that today. And you might think, wow, that doesn't look very smooth. But this road still exists today. Did you catch that? 6 BC, and it still exists today. The city of Atlanta could probably learn a thing or two about infrastructure <laughs> and building roads that last beyond maybe just you know, one winter season. These roads predated the church. I think, I believe truly, this is a part of God's magnificent plan and methodology. In order for the gospel to go, I'm going to literally lay the groundwork for Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. I'm going to lay this road down. By the way, I'm going to use pagans to do it. So that which was used by pagans, I'm going to use and glorify for my name's sake as these cities come to hear the gospel for the first time. Astounding. One, uh, one theologian puts it this way. Paul deliberately crosses geographical barriers for the gospel. Moreover, Paul's mission deliberately crosses the ethnic religious barriers by turning to Gentiles. And what made that possible? This road. This road, the Via Sebast. And you may have noticed on that map, you saw that there was a region called Galatia. And many of you are familiar with the Paul's letter to the Galatians. And it is very likely that the four cities that he goes to, Pisidian Antioch, or Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, are four cities in Galatia that Paul is writing to in that letter. And while it's tempting to look at the book of Acts in a vacuum, we must understand that this is a story that's being laid out, and we get greater nuance, and we get greater depth, we get greater emotion and greater teaching when we look at these letters. So don't separate the two. Yes, they are separate books, but here we see in verse, chapters 13 and 14, really the underpinnings for why and the occasion for why Paul writes to the Galatian church. So why these places? Why do they go to these places? Is it just because the road is there? No. We, we see Barnabas going back to his own home island. He goes back to his hometown. He goes to Cyprus. That's where Barnabas is from. So there was some methodology there. There was some reason. There was some purpose there. And again, why these cities? Because they were cities of influence. And there were cities along this road. And now, now we can see that there's a pattern that emerges as we look at Acts 13 and 14. And again, to spare us the time and the energy, what we're going to do, rather than dive into each of the cities and what happens, I believe we see very common occurrences in each of these places. And this is the pattern. First, what is, that, what is it that they do? They enter into these notable cities. Like I mentioned, they go to these cities along the road, either because of personal significance or because of prominence within the empire. Okay, you may have noticed on that map that there were two Antiochs, Antioch in Syria and Antioch in Pisidia. Well, guess what? There were actually 16 cities named Antioch after a, the, a, a King Seleucus who named these cities after his father. This is nothing new for us here in Atlanta, right? Because how many roads do we know around here that start off with peace tree or have peace tree in it, right? We can navigate that after some time. It gets a little, you know, getting used to. People back in the Roman Empire, they knew that Antioch, they would have to specify which Antioch, like we do, which peace tree, where are you headed? It depends on where you're headed, right? And even then, you can get on like three different peace trees. <laughs> so they go to places that are familiar. They go to these cities that are notable, they go to cities that have a great uh, prominence. Uh, Pisidian Antioch was known as Galatia's second city. It wasn't the capital city, but it certainly had a great military presence, and it was strategic where it was in the interior of Asia Minor. Not only that, they go to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And we know that these cities are notable because the road went there. If the city wasn't notable, then a road would not go there. It's kind of like when you drive around town here and you see a dirt path, that probably is not going to lead you to a Kroger's. No, it's going to lead you to someone's farm or someone's house that's been long forgotten. 
Okay, roads take you to places, and that's what Paul and Barnabas did. They followed the roads to where the people are. And guess who was at these cities? And we see this in a couple of the cities mentioned here, but also in, in Paul's other missionary journeys. Not only does he enter cities, but he explains then when he goes into these cities, he explains to the Jews in the synagogues, right? He goes to the synagogues, and this is actually in step with his model, what he even says in Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's not prioritizing and saying Jews are more important than. He's just saying that in terms of my order, my method, I'm going to go to the Jew first. I'm going to go into the synagogue first because it was shared culture, shared language, shared history. Right? Paul is being wise about the methodology with which he goes to the gospel mission. Now, in Lystra and Derby, there's no mention of a synagogue. These were likely more Gentile regions, and Paul shifts his pattern a bit. Not only do we see them going into these towns and then going into these synagogues, but we see this encounter with God, and oftentimes this encounter with God is a, is a miracle, right? In, in Cyprus, we see this encounter with Bar-Jesus, who is, who, uh, or Elymas, the magician, Right? We see something that happens, some sort of spiritual warfare, some sort of spiritual confrontation. Right? And God uses this to then elicit a response. Right? Belief or rejection. And this is the thing for us to get. Make sure we hear this in regards to the methodology. Because you might hear, okay, that makes sense. Paul is a Jew of Jews. He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. Makes sense to go to the synagogues first because that's what he knew. But then guess what happens? The response that was elicited a lot of times in these synagogues was rejection. No, this is too much for us to hear. Those, the very same people, well, not the same people, but this very same message when it was preached by Stephen, it led to his stoning. And guess who was there giving approval? Saul was, who was later called Paul. And Paul's mission is to the Gentiles. And so we see this turning point in Acts 13, verse 47. If you have your Bibles, you can look there. It says this, for the Lord has commanded us saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, certainly Paul is referring to himself, but also he's saying to the Jews, we were given this message. We were given this good news and somehow we miss it. And I'm trying to show to you how you missed it. And as we're given this message, it's not just for us, but it's also for the nations. How have you missed this? Now I'm here proclaiming it to you. This is a key, key verse for us as we look at this pattern, because this is where the method almost stops in its tracks. Because someone tracking along would say, yep, I can get see that. Notable cities makes sense. Yep, encounter with God. That makes sense. When God calls people to himself, he's going he's gonna to act. He's going to move. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. To the Gentiles? This makes no sense. We just learned about this a couple weeks ago with Peter and Cornelius, and even to Peter as he is explaining back to the Jerusalem church. What we then see after some time and after some um, presence in this city, because Paul's intention is never to just stay in each of these cities. This is a journey, right? He stays for a little bit in each of these places. But what does he do? And we see this at, toward the end of Acts chapter 14, verse 23. It says, and when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So Paul is going, Paul and Barnabas are going to these cities, establishing churches, establishing their own leadership. And then he goes back. He goes back to Antioch and ultimately to Jerusalem. You might ask, okay, well, so they just simply took the path of least resistance in this first missionary journey. And to a degree, absolutely they did. They went to known places and they used existing roads. But to say that their journey was easy would be a, a falsity. And traveling back then was incredibly hard. And by the way, this was a journey of a thousand, over a thousand miles round trip. Like I celebrate when I get to 13,000 steps in a day. Right? These guys were probably doing that easily by mid-morning as they're going from town to town. And I would venture to say, like, shoe technology back then is not nearly where it is today. 
So I don't know how comfortable it was. And by the way, these roads, even though these roads existed, it made it easier for people like Paul and Barnabas to go on these missionary journeys. It made it easier for military to go from city to city. It made it easier for merchants to go from city to city. But also, these roads made it easier for robbers to come and to ambush people. So this was a very dangerous prospect to go. So their journey was filled with persecution. We see this throughout these two chapters. When I think about path of least resistance, I think about a very um, specific moment with my discipleship group a couple of years ago. I have a discipleship group of um, some young men in their 20s, and we went to one of my favorite places in all of the state of Georgia, which is Tallulah Gorge. And if you've ever been to Tallulah Gorge, you know it's a, a sight to behold. It almost makes you feel like, how is this in Georgia? Right? And there are trails around the rim of the gorge, but you can actually hike down into the gorge itself. Right? When I say hike, I mean you take a bunch of steps down. Right? One of the things that you can do when you, before you go on those steps is to go into the nature center and get a permit and sit through a little class and you can actually hike into the gorge down to the waterfall. Now, if I get difficulty like later this summer of getting my permit to get in, because they only give a limited number of permits, it's because I'm saying it now to all of you. If you haven't done it, you should absolutely go do it, okay, is what I'm saying, because it's a sight to behold. And they tell you when you get down to the gorge, you're going to have to rock up, you're going to have to cross the river, and at the very end of all of this, there's a waterfall that you can like slide down and, and swim. All right, I'm there, I'll do it. And when I was younger, it was a lot of fun. Now that I'm a little bit older, I'm nervous, right? Is this, is this step going to be stable? Can I get over there without, you know, getting my whole body wet, right? And this is the, the thoughts that are racing through my head. And as I'm about to kind of step foot, I turn around and tell the guys, hey, make sure you just follow this pathway. It's going to lead us down. They're already on the other side of the river. They're already on top of these boulders as big as my house. I'm like, how? Why? Get down from there. That's not safe. Come over here. Get to this pathway. And yet there is something about, you know, a 20-year-old who's going to say, I can do it and I'm going to conquer it. You can't tell me just to stay on this path. I'm going to go over there and forge a new path. That's literally what they told us or what they told me. I was like, please don't let a ranger see us. We're going to get in so much trouble. And in that, I kind of see a similarity for us here in the church today. We just say, no, we just got to keep our heads down and stay on this well-beaten path. This path is here and it's a good thing. And that's right. Yes. But we also need people and we also need to support new and creative ways to go out on mission and to bring the gospel to places where it has never been brought. What avenues toward kingdom growth already exist around us? I think there are a lot. I just gave an example through my own discipleship group, the way that we walk and journey together and the ways that we evangelize the people around us together, never in a vacuum, together. And one of the new initiatives here, which is not really a new initiative, but an old initiative that has just given a new name and, and given a refreshing, which is city impact teams. Where has God placed you? And rather than thinking where I want to go, God, will you place me there? Right? The saying being the grass is greener on the other side. If I only had this, if I could only live this way, if I could only drive this car, if I could only live in that place and have that job and have this kind of, that kind of thinking is very self-defeating, isn't it? When was the last time we said, God, would you use me right where I am? For some of us, that's just to our immediate families. For me, I know as a father, it's to my daughter and to my son and to my wife. It's also, for me personally, as I'm walking through hardness of life, it means ministering even to my mother-in-law. Not because she's a bear to be around, I love her dearly, but because we just experienced a great tragedy. How can I love the people around me? How can I love my neighbors in my cul-de-sac? How can I love the people in my own subdivision? How can I love the, the people in my own cluster, in my school cluster? How can I love the people in my immediate community? How can I love the people that I see on a regular basis at Costco or at Trader Joe's or wherever I go grocery shopping? How can I love my county? How can I love my state? How can I love my country? How can I love this place that God has placed me? Rather than thinking, God, take me away from here to over there, thinking, God, thank you for placing me here for right now, for this moment. How can I be faithful to you? 
I'm not saying that discomfort and unfamiliarity are our goals in the Christian life, but neither should comfort and neither should familiarity. Our goal should be faithfulness to God. Our goal should be putting his mission first, the mission that he has called us to. So that's our method. That's our method. What is our message and, and who are the messengers? What do we see here and who are we? Well, let's start with the messengers. I already mentioned Barnabas, right? Barnabas is known as the son of encouragement. We see this in, in, in Acts chapter 9. This is his nickname, right? He was the one person that brought Saul along, who would later become Paul, to the leaders in Jerusalem and say, hey, I know this sounds crazy, guys, but Jesus has called him, and now we must support him. But he was also from Cyprus, right? And again, he's going to his hometown. He, stood, he stands up even for John Mark. We didn't read about this, but John Mark actually leaves this journey. They go through Cyprus. They get to Perga. Right? When they land on, you know, in what is modern day Turkey before they head up to Antioch and Pisidio, John Mark hightails it out of there. He's like, this isn't it. This ain't it, bro. It's time to go. Right? And surely that caused division between Paul and Barnabas. And what does he say? Well, Barnabas stands up for John Mark to Paul. Paul, on the other hand, we know about his calling, right? We know a little bit about his story, which is that he was someone that persecuted the church, right? He did it with great pleasure, right? He, he sought after the approval of his leadership to go, give me the green light, give me a license to go arrest and persecute these Christians who are defaming Jewish religious tradition. This is his calling through Ananias, who, by the way, Ananias was like, wait, God, are you asking me to go help this guy who has been openly persecuting the church, right? Paul's on this road to Damascus, right? A voice calls out, Saul, Saul, why, do you, why are you persecuting me, right? He goes and finds Ananias. Ananias hears about this and is like, you want me to do what? I need to approve who? And what do you want me to tell him? Okay, I'll be faithful to you. And this is what he says in uh, verse 15 of chapter 9. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he, Saul, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I don't know where you were the first time you ate kale. <laughs> I know where I was. I was... A wee kid, and uh, my parents had a restaurant. Kale was the decorative greenage around the salad bar. And now, like, that's, you would find kale as a centerpiece of a salad bar. That just kind of blows my mind. I remember asking my dad, what is this green stuff? It's kale, and we use it to decorate. <laughs> if my dad knew how popular kale was today, he would have flipped his mind. And kale is now like this amazing thing. And it's good. I, I get it. Like, you know, to a degree. But I remember the first time I ate it, I just thought, why do people like this? It must really be healthy for it to taste this bad. <laughs> In a similar way, I think when Paul hears this for the first time, it's like, oh, yeah, you want me to be a Christian, the people that I used to persecute. Oh, that, I don't know about that, but... I can't deny that I used to be able to see and now I can't. I can't deny I was on a road and I heard you call me by name and said, why do you persecute me? So I guess you're real. I guess I need to follow along. I'll do it. And this is what Ananias says then to Paul. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. It's kind of like you're fed that first spoonful and you're like, ooh, I don't know. And then here's another spoonful. Oof, that was worse than the first. And yet, what is Saul? What is Paul? Incredibly faithful. Incredibly faithful. And why? Why were these messengers faithful? Because of the message that they were carrying. And who spoke this message? Ultimately, God first. Gospel preaching was the message. And how, what, how, what was the, the process? What was the outline? 
Well, if you look at Peter's message in Acts 2, if you look at Stephen's message in Acts 7, and you look at Paul's message here in Acts 13, and you can assume in later parts when he goes to these different cities and different synagogues, he's probably saying the same thing, which is this. Here is our Jewish history. Here is our shared culture. Here is our shared identities as Jews in this foreign place. And somehow we have missed this Jesus. Here's our redemptive history and here's God's redeemer hidden right there in plain sight. And I know that's an oxymoron. How can something be hidden in plain sight? Because the spirit had veiled the eyes of unbelievers. What do we do as a church and what did Paul do? You speak that message boldly and you allow the spirit to do that work. And here's a note about boldness. When you look at verse 46 of chapter 13 and verse three of chapter 14, it says that Paul and Barnabas spoke with boldness. They spoke boldly. The implication and the application rather being that the message itself is a bold message. Not that Paul and Barnabas have to be bold, which they were, don't get me wrong, they were. But what fed that boldness? The gospel message itself. And what is the gospel message? That Jesus Christ, God's very son, has come from heaven to earth to live the life that you could not live. That's, that is without sin and in imperfection. And he died the death that you could not die or would ever be willing to die, which is punishment for the sin that we have and have expressed and have do and, and continue to do. And he was raised again from the dead, something that we are incapable of doing. But God himself, through Jesus Christ, has done that. He is the redeemer. And he doesn't do it for his own glory. Yes, he does. But he also does it for our own sake, for our own benefit. This is why in Acts chapter 13, when Paul preaches to the Gentiles in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, what did they do? They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believed in the word of God spread in that area. It is like someone telling you the best news you have ever heard in your life. And it is not just for you. It is for your whole family. It is for your whole neighborhood. It is for your whole city. It is for everyone. Jesus Christ saves us. You don't have to work so hard to earn favor with God. Jesus has done it for you. We see this throughout the epistles. If you are confused about the message, go to any of these letters, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, so on and so forth. What is Paul concerned about? that the church would be in Christ, that Christ would be central. He is our redeemer. By the way, I didn't mention this, but Timothy, Timothy was from one of these first towns that Paul visited. He is known, we see this in 2 Timothy 3, says, you, however, have not followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured yet from them all. The Lord has rescued me. Why would Paul say this to Timothy if he wasn't there himself? Timothy knows these words from Paul because he was there with him as a new convert. Boldness. It used to be that the the medium was just as important as the message, right? Nowadays, why would you send a telegram to anyone? That's just a lot of trouble and a lot of work. I I mean, if you're under the age of 25, picking up the phone to make a phone call actually is a lot of work. You'd much rather just type out a message and send it, right? You're not even typing out full coherent sentences. You're not even typing out entire words, right? I know this because I got an 11 year old and I look at her with her permission. I look at her messaging history with her friends and it doesn't make any sense to me. I just see random letters strung together and she's like, oh, well, that's because she's asking about this and this is that. I'm like, how, why? And not only do we not use letters, then we we use pictures. We use emojis to, to communicate how we feel. It used to be that the method was as important as the message. Nowadays, all we need to do is just pick up our phone and we say something. But I really believe, brothers and sisters, 
that we who carry the gospel message are just as important as this message that we are bringing. But don't ever be confused that you are more important than it. And that leads me to my third point, the means. What is the means of our mission? As we go proclaiming, as we go with this gospel good news, right, those words being caruso in the Greek, to proclaim, to be a herald, to bring uh, good news, we're also to bring good news and good news that is something that gives us joy. Ro Romans 15, it talks about this. Paul says, how then will they call on him in him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without hearing someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news which is a direct quote from Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. This was the message that Paul and Barnabas were literally doing. Their feet were traveling these mountain roads to these cities to preach this bold message to a people who did not believe. And as people believed, and as churches were established, the message went forward because they were bringing good news not just news of condemnation and, and destruction, news of good news, of, of a redeemer, of a God who loves, of a God who is gracious, of a God who is holy and just absolutely and demands that of us. But a God who says, you can't do this on your own. You need me. You need my son, Jesus. And in him, you are able to do these things. Let's not be so quick to think that our boldness is more important than the boldness of the message that we bring. And how do we do this? The means is the Holy Spirit. 13.2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 13.4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Saul, who was called Paul, 13.9, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Disciples who were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Verse 52, the work of the Spirit is active. And this is happening in the face of a spirit of unbelief and persecution. Remember Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I remember my dad who was also a mechanic would invite me every now and then. And I really say invite, because there's no reason or explanation other than, let me throw Jimmy a bone here. He'd say, hold this flashlight while I try to unscrew this under the hood. If, if you had a dad like this, you know all too well where this story is going, right? He would say, no, not on the back of my head, right here, pointed here. No, Jim, Jimmy, right here, I can't see anything. Move it here, move. Okay, come over here. Hold the flashlight like this. Let me show you. Hold it like that. Don't move. And then as soon as like the wrench touches the bolt, it's like I'm already off somewhere else. And like my mind's not help. Like I don't know how I'm supposed to help you. Like what do you want me to do? Like you're reaching way under this car and, and then it ends up just being an argument later on. He was giving me the means to help him, but I didn't get it. And a lot of times we're doing the same thing, aren't we? We're saying, God, I know you're doing a lot of work over here. But you know what? I'm really comfortable right here. And I'm going to just sit here and I'm going to do this. God, I know you're doing a lot of work over there in this part of the world. But God, would you really just do something here in our country? Can you just do something here first? We're losing sight of the bigger picture, church. We're not in this by ourselves. Another example of this is in a baton or in a relay race. I recently saw a video of a botched relay baton handoff. I can't imagine what is more stressful and, and hard than doing that in front of a crowd of people. You feel horribly for these athletes. And I had to go watch another video of a successful baton transfer in a world record run. And it is a sight to behold how these batons are transferred. There is method to it. There is method in that madness. I feel like a lot of times we're questioning, do I want to hand this baton to that person in front of me? Or we're thinking, do I want to receive this baton from the person behind me? If that were the attitude of Paul and Barnabas, 
we'd be in a lot of trouble. I would dare say that we wouldn't be here. What did Paul and Barnabas do as they journeyed? Did they stay and live there? No, they left. They established churches and then said, here are your leaders. We're going because this message has to keep on going. And if it's dependent on us, we're screwed. You guys have to be able to carry on this mantle. You have to be able to carry this baton. So go and keep on doing this. Let's not be so surprised at who's handing us the baton, and let's not be so surprised at to whom we hand this baton to, because what's more important than any of the racers is this gospel message. Let's be the church. Let's be a group of people who have been called out, who move in the power of the Spirit. He is our means. He is our hope. He is our salvation. The church comes from the the Greek word ekklesia, which means the called out assembly. We know that this work is going to be hard because The Bible says so, but we are not to approach it as individuals. 1 Corinthians 12, just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, and so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. John 17, 20, Jesus' own prayer for the believers to come. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Father, as you are in me and I in you, may they be in us that the world may believe. In 1 Peter 2, we are a spiritual house of living stones built upon the rejected cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. God is working in and through us together. So let's not run this race as individuals, but together as a church. We just sang about this earlier this morning. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. The church will not cease with us. The church will not cease with our children and our children's children. The church will go on until God says, I'm coming back. And we await that glorious day. Together we are called out. Together we are to go on radical mission because that's where God is. No wonder when John is given a peek into heaven, he sees this in Revelation 7. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice. They're unified in one thing, even though they are a disparate group of people. They're as diverse as they come. What are they unified in? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the land. They're glorifying the bold message speaker, Jesus Christ, God himself. So let us go and be bold for his glory, for his sake, not for ours, not for our name, but for the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would lead us as we go and that we would be faithful followers of you. Thank you for these words and thank you for this challenge to us as we see in scripture. So Lord, we pray that we would see where it is that you're already moving and that we would be faithful to go as you lead us by your spirit. Jesus, it is in your name that we pray, amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.